Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Socrates as a person, as a teacher, as a martyr, and as what we might call a philosophical hero, left a really massive impression upon those who were concerned with philosophy in Athens. That's why we see multiple schools of philosophy emerging from, uh, you might say, from the, the nexus uh, of, of uh, his teaching and his, his way of life and his friendship. And the Stoics look to him particularly as an ideal, as an exemplar of the way that a person ought to be. Um, quite a, a lot of the things that, that they're, they're saying about him are borne out by um, what we have in the historical record from Xenophon and Plato about Socrates. Um, and what I want to look at here is Epictetus' picture of Socrates. What made Socrates such a great guy that we should emulate him. You notice that, that Socrates is brought up as an, as an example throughout Epictetus' discourses. It really comes together in book four, though, and so I've got quite a few things on the board here that he talks about. What's particularly interesting is that Stoics do, in fact, care about what people think of them, but they care only about what people whose opinion really matters, or whose judgment really matters, because it's well informed about the nature of the good for human beings and how human beings want to behave and, and relate themselves to each other and to, to themselves. And so Epictetus will, will actually say at, at one point in chapter 7 of book uh, 4 that Socrates is the kind of person that he cares about uh, that, that he wants to appear good in the, the sight of, that he would like to have uh, had a good impression of him. Of course, Socrates by this time is long dead, but he's using Socrates as sort of uh, a stand-in. Socrates is the kind of person whose opinion Epictetus would, would greatly value. Other people's uh, not quite so important. Uh, in, in chapter 4, uh, he talks about Socrates as being the kind of person who took circumstances as they were given to him. And so he doesn't fight against things. He doesn't cooperate with evil, of course. Um, as a matter of fact, Epictetus brings up uh, Socrates and his refusal to collaborate with an unjust execution of, of an Athenian citizen, <coughs> um, which is recounted by, by Socrates uh, in, in, in Plato's works, he, Epictetus brings this up in, as an example of Socrates' justice and Socrates not allowing other people's threats, you know, externals, to interfere with keeping his faculty of, of uh, choice in accordance with nature. But um, Epictetus talks about Socrates in this case as being somebody who is able to enjoy leisure, scholae, uh, you know, sitting around talking in the, the gymnasium, talking in the parks with young men about philosophy. But when it comes time for him to go on a military campaign, he's equally happy to go on military campaign and fight against whoever he's supposed to. In that case, follow orders. Uh, we know that Socrates did in fact fight uh, as, as a soldier for Athens. And he says Socrates is not the sort of guy who, when he's on military campaign, is going to say, oh, woe is me, I don't have the leisure anymore to chat with the, the young men about philosophy. He's, he's okay with it. He's, he's taking things as they come. He is, another way to say it in the Stoic vernacular, 
is to have his will in accordance with the way things turn out. Um, so what that means is that he's somebody who's serene. He's, he's, he's happy. He's unhampered, unhindered. He's free. So again, he provides a, an example of what Stoicism holds out to us as a promise. In uh, chapter 5, which has to do with contentious people, he, he's uh, presented as somebody who is a great example in managing his relationships, particularly his household relationships, well. So um, Epictetus will say, Socrates bore very firmly in mind that no one is master over another's governing principle. He willed accordingly nothing but what was his own. And what was that? Not to try to make other people act in accordance with nature, for that does not belong to one, but while they are attending to their own business as they think best, himself nonetheless to be and to remain in a state of harmony with nature, attending to his own business to the end that they may also be in harmony with nature. Um, he actually calls Socrates there the good and excellent man. Right? Um, later on, he talks about, in the same chapter, uh, he, he parses this out in terms of his home life. And uh, if you know anything about Socrates, he, he had a wife who was rather um, contentious, let's say. And he had children who were a bit of a disappointment. So he says, all of this is what Socrates bore in mind as he managed his house, putting up with a shrewish wife and an unkindly son. For to what end was she shrewish? <clears throat> to the end that she might pour all the water she pleased over his head and might trample underfoot the cake. Yet, what is that to me if I regard these things as meaning nothing to me? But this control over the moral purpose is my true business, and it neither shall a tyrant hinder me against it, nor the multitude, the single individual, nor the stronger man, the weaker, nor bad kids or, you know, a wife who's, who's kind of a troublesome, uh, neighbors, uh, he doesn't get into the threats of, of uh, people who, who say you better stop doing philosophy. As a matter of fact, at his trial, he says, I'm going to keep doing it no matter what, so you're probably going to have to put a stop to me. Um, so, you know, that's uh, another part of the picture. Uh, in, in chapter 8, um, Epictetus says something else that's very interesting. He brings up the fact that people would go to Socrates and ask to be introduced to philosophers, not thinking Socrates himself to be a philosopher. And they wanted to be introduced to sophists, to people who weren't really philosophers. And did Socrates get upset about that and say, I don't know why you're bothering with those people. I'm the real deal. No. Socrates very calmly and serenely said, sure, I'll introduce you to Prodicus. I'll introduce you to this guy over here. Why? Because Socrates was concerned not with appearing to be a philosopher, not with being thought to be a philosopher by other people, but actually being a philosopher, doing what it is that a philosopher ought to do, having the focus on the things that really matter. Um, in in uh, chapter 12 of book 2, uh, Epictetus has a great example about how to carry out inquiry with others, and he uses Socrates as an example there, of how the Stoic ought to behave. So I'm going to actually read this uh, at, a, at a little bit of length with some commentary. He says, um, when, when people are mistaken, what should you do? How, how should you deal with them? Should you say, oh, they, they're just uneducated. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to work with them. Um, it's impossible to do anything with these people. He says, no, the real guide, whenever he finds a person going astray, leads him back to the right road. Instead of leaving him with a scornful laugh or an insult, um, so you should also show the person the truth, and you'll see that they'll follow if they're ready to. So long as you don't show him the truth, don't scorn him, don't laugh at him. Recognize your own incapacity. How did Socrates approach this sort of thing? There, there is where it becomes very interesting. He used to force the man who was arguing with him to be his own witness. He, Socrates would continually ask a person who said, well, other people say X, Y, Z, he would say, well, what do you think? In doing so, he would make that person into their own witness. He would, he would call them to, you know, make clear what it was that they were committed to. And then they would see whether it was consistent or not. This is a way that one can actually make some sort of progress. He says, um, 
this is, this is why he could say, I can dispense with all the others, and I'm always satisfied to have my own fellow disputant for a witness, and the votes of the rest I don't care about, but only my uh, person that I'm discussing this with. For he used to make so clear the consequences which followed from the concepts that everybody realized the contradiction involved and gave up the battle. So he gives some examples here. And if you, if you look at Plato's dialogues, you're going to see that. Um, what did Socrates do? Did he laugh at people? Did he treat them badly? Did he pull rank? Did he appeal to authority? No, he would work with the person as he found them and try to get them to see where things were not good for them, where there were conflicts, where there were contradictions, and then try to suggest some way past that. And if the person was ready to hear that, they would embrace it. Sometimes they would get very upset with him. Uh, and, and again, though, he doesn't have control over that. So this is just a portion, but, but some of the key points of Epictetus' sort of composite picture of Socrates as a Stoic sage, a wise person, or you might say an exemplar, a hero, somebody who is to be emulated and followed.